Hey everyone, this is Artemis from the Uncivilized Podcast. Today I have with me Dr. Paulette Steves. She is the author of the recently released The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, welcome to the show. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, Tansi, hello in Cree. I'm Dr. Paulette Steves. I'm a Cree Métis Indigenous Archaeologist. I teach at uh, Algoma University in Sociology, Anthropology, Geography, Geology, and Land Stewardship, and I'm a Canada Research Chair in Healing and Reconciliation. That's, uh, that's quite the resume you got there. Would you like to talk about kind of how you came to this position and maybe how that relates to the development of the book? Yeah, everything in um, Indigenous lives and, you know, Indigenous research is relational. It's related. And um, in 1988, I, I grew up in Lillooet, British Columbia in Canada, and I was about to leave my hometown, a newly divorced uh, single parent with three kids and no money. And so I went to visit with a local elder just to get his, uh, his advice. And he said, you know, that the elders, they had watched me grow up and they talked about me quite often. And they thought that I would have a really difficult job to do um, in my future. And um, he said what I was going through at the time was hard, but it was training, teaching me to deal with hard situations that would, uh, in my future, lead me to do work that would really support Indigenous people, not just our local people, but all Indigenous people. And at the time, I had no idea what he meant. Um, but when I was graduating with my PhD in 2015, his words were just ringing in my ears because... Um, this is the job that I was given to do is to rewrite Indigenous history. And it certainly has been probably the most difficult thing I've done in my life. That's, that's yeah, that sounds pretty, that's pretty heavy. And I'm not sure, you know, I wonder how many people can really relate to something like that, right? To have that, what seems like a large weight on your shoulders because of what you're up against. And you talk about in the book, like, hundreds of years, right? Not just of colonialism, but particularly like the history that's been constructed. And I find interesting when you say rewrite, and I made, I made a note of that to myself. I was like, is it rewriting or is it reclaiming? Because I think the argument that I was finding is that what was rewritten was the colonial narrative, right? That the narrative that was put on to people of the Western hemisphere. So what do you think about the, the difference between rewriting and reclaiming? Well, I, I usually discuss it in all my publications as reclaiming first and rewriting second. Okay. And what would you say the difference between those two things are? Well, Indigenous people, we've always known our history. It's been passed on in oral traditions for years. It's never, ever been in line with what the Western archaeologists uh, have stated. But, you know, my work is not just archaeological. It's political, it's social justice, it's cultural. So a big part of my work was understanding and coming to know the history of colonization um, in archaeology and in the Western Academy. So, you know, people know that um, settlers came to this land and they stole the land, claiming the people were not human and weren't using the land. So there was a doctrine of discovery and a papal bull, which has still never been rescinded. Uh, that created a path for settlers to steal the land from Indigenous people. And when you're stealing land and you're killing a lot of people, you have to justify it in some way. And part of that justification is how archaeologists have framed Indigenous people as recent immigrants from Asia. So we haven't been mm -hmm. here very long. Uh, you know, we're not really as evolved as people in the rest of the world and yada, yada, yada. That's how the story goes. And there, there's so much to this story. It's amazing. It's actually Vine Deloria Jr. said that it's absurd uh, that Western archaeologists claim this. And I completely agree with him, and we'll get to that later. But there is so much evidence of Indigenous people being in the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, for over 130,000 years that it's it's crazy, too, that it's been stuck in one place that we've only been here, you know, 10 or 12 or 14,000 years, they've been saying that since the 1920s. And if you look around the world, human evolution, our understanding of human migrations across time has completely changed in the last 15, 20 years everywhere in the world, except for the Americas. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find that interesting. And I'm sure we'll get to this because I made a note of it was that the rewriting of, you know, the out of Africa theory, right, that we always see this as kind of redeveloping, right? We find new trees and relationships and migration patterns. But like any possible discussion of of that in, in opposition to Clovis, right, which I'm sure, you know, I hope you can define for us is that's shamed. And as you said, that's almost like it's like it's career suicide, right? It's self self-destruction to even consider like, well, if it's if we see that it goes so much further back, literally across the world, right? Because our understanding of what a human is has developed and has expanded and is much, much deeper, much longer history, then why doesn't it apply here? And I think, you know, that is kind of the crux of your work is confronting that question to some degree. I love, of course, many things. So uh, before we get into the history of your work, can you define maybe what Clovis means and why it's such an embedded notion in Western archaeology and anthropology? Yeah, well, it became a, a gatekeeping tool of colonization to keep us infantile, uh, you know, on a global scale as far as human evolutions and human um, populations go. So Clovis was a fluted tool, but let me back up just a little bit. In um, in the early 1920s, um, Alex Herlishka worked for the Smithsonian Museum, and he had argued that Indigenous people had been in the Americas for 3,000 years. That wasn't based on any solid data set. That was conjecture from, you know, he looked at one or two sites in Alaska. And then Jesse Figgins from the Denver Museum, he went out to New Mexico and they found this, what's now known as a Clovis point embedded in, a, in the rib of a bison that had been extinct for over 10,000 years. So the Clovis point or the Clovis tool is very easily identifiable because it has a large flute, usually from the base towards the end of the tip. Um, they are very stylistic, very, uh, very beautiful tools. And um, Jesse Figgins had to argue with people for a few years to get it accepted. If you find a tool in the rib of a bison that we know has been extinct for 10,000 years, then hello, people have been here for over 10,000 years. So eventually, Jesse Figgins got that accepted. Alex Herlishka never accepted it. So that was in the mid to late 1920s. And it's kind of been stuck there ever since. And what, what archaeologists have done also to erase Indigenous people and Indigenous cultural diversity is they invented the Clovis people. So anywhere you found Clovis tools was discussed as, oh, the Clovis people were here. And that's um, that's completely false. A, a cultural group of people is usually found in a small regional area and they have differences in language and clothes and customs and housing. And um, no, nowhere in the world is there a cultural group or a group of people that are as big as an entire continent. But I went into the, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst Library and I was looking through the books of uh, Cherokee and um, different indigenous cultures. And I came across uh, a book there, The Clovis People, which was really a book on archaeological sites. So, you know, it's part and parcel of erasure, erasing the diversity. The Americas are, are the most linguistically diverse area of the entire world. And when mm -hmm. you, you know, when you continually say that we're the Clovis people or this is a Clovis people site, that's completely false, completely unscientific and completely wrong. Yet archaeologists do that continually. And it's not that they don't know that there is no cultural group as big as an entire continent, but it's a part of the embedded violence against indigenous people and, and erasure. Yeah, so I'm sh we're definitely going to circle back, but back to your book, you mentioned, or my understanding is that it's based heavily on your dissertation, and I'm curious where that began. Like, was it like a gr gradual realization, or was it something that was an obvious disconnect between the academic monopoly on truth and the variety of stories that you mentioned of Indigenous people? And I'm sure this relates, as you said, to your conversation with the elders, but what is kind of the, the intellectual development behind the book? Well, I, I started graduate uh, school in the molecular genetics um, anthropology field, and uh, I had difficulties with the ethics of that work. So I switched to archaeology. But one question, because the students that I went to school with were mentioning it so much, oh, you've only, guys only been here, you know, 12,000 years, you cl Clovis people, Clovis tools. And I'm like, what is that all about? So I started reading up on it. And then I started finding articles about pre-Clovis sites. 
And I emailed uh, Dr. Steve Holen, who was at the time the head archaeologist at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I asked him, uh, do you know of any pre-Clovis sites? Because like, it really got to me. I'm like, well, how long have people been here? And what, what does the physical evidence say? I know what oral tradition says. Anyways, mm -hmm. he, he emailed me back and he said, well, here's a list of 10 sites. Some of them I've worked on, he said, but don't tell anyone what you're studying. They're just going to call you crazy. Well, if it's going to be your dissertation, you kind of have to tell people. But I took those 10 sites and, and found the articles and the books on them. And within two weeks from that first 10 sites, I had a list of over 500 sites that predated Clovis. And that really, uh, that really cemented what I would do for my dissertation. So one of the things, you know, being, being colonized, um, removes a lot of our cultural practices. And I grew up, I didn't grow up, uh, you know, in an indigenous community. I grew up in different small urban communities and um, always, always had a lot of friends, uh, you know, living on the reservation, didn't really have any white friends. So we, we knew we were Indian and we were told by the general public we were indigenous. Mm -hmm. But, but um, I really started thinking about that question and the importance of that question to indigenous people. So the, the Western story of the, you know, Clovis sites and Clovis people, and we've been here 12 to 14,000 years, that didn't um, match oral traditions that I knew or I had heard or I had studied. And it, I found it did not match the archeological record. So these um, archeologists, a small group of archeologists in North and South America that were documenting and dating and recording and publishing on pre-Clovis sites, they really put their careers on the line. This area of archaeology in the Americas was called an area of academic suicide and mm -hmm. very much discouraged. Now, that should not be um, in any field of science, specifically not in archaeology. Our job is to study the human past and to create better understandings of human migrations and evolution across time. You can't do that if it's going to end your career. I, I know. Mm -hmm. I know a few archaeologists were fired. I know that some lost their funding, but there was something that was just tugging at their at their spirit that they needed to tell the truth. And if they found dates that were fourteen thousand five hundred or over twenty thousand years, they were going to publish on it, and they were going to suffer the consequence. And and they knew that, and they they talk about that in some of their books and publications about how terrified they were when their dates came back to be older than Clovis. Um, just just think about that. I would ask listeners to just think about that. That's beyond intimidation. That's policing. Mm -hmm. You know, and there was a group of archaeologists that were known as the Clovis police that denied every site. And even, you know, Louis Leakey, he was the well-known paleontologist from South Africa that did all the early human sites. And um, he came and worked on a site in Southern California, the Calico site. And when he published that there were different levels there dating from over 20,000 to 200,000 years, all the, you know, the archaeologists in North America called him a crazy old man and a drunkard. So, you know, he was no longer a preeminent global scientist. He was, you know, an old drunk. Yeah. And so what I find interesting, and there's, I have so many thoughts about everything you just said is particularly about the, the contradiction, so to speak, between the Western hegemony of truth and uh, indigenous oral stories and, and self self-realization is this emphasis on, on is particularly anthropology and archeology span and history is this idea of once we begin to write, those have more truth, even if they're mythological, there's something to be said, right? So that's even how certain bib uh, biblical skeptics read it, or they read the Epic of Gilgamesh. So it's almost like they say, you know, there's some kernel of truth in written stories, but there's none, or it's, you know, it's it's a fairy tale with no truth in it at all in oral stories. Why do you think that might be that we have this emphasis? Is that because we have a a bias or a, a prejudice against oral stories because we are a so-called literate culture? Well, yeah, that's that's pretty evident. And it's, you know, it's a really um it's a really easy way for archaeologists to erase indigenous voices and knowledge. But one of the things I've done in my book is I've looked at oral traditions and I've looked at archaeological sites and there are oral traditions that were later proven to actually be factual based on archaeological sites. So the Osage tribe had an oral tradition about 
a, a battle between the giant beasts. So at one time there was so many giant beasts on the land, it wasn't safe to go out hunting or fishing. And um, <clears throat> those beasts would have been mastodons and, and mammoths. And so um, the Osage tr tradition tells about a, a day when the beasts had a big fight. They had a big battle and a lot of them killed each other. Well, then it was safe to go back on the land again, but the Osage wanted to honor them because the land was safe again. And so they burned all the, the beasts that had died in this place. And every single year they went back and held a ceremony to honor those uh, beasts at that place. Well, the Osage were moved from that area. It's near the Palm de Terre River. And, uh, you know, settlers were, were given the land and they started finding a lot of bones and stone tools. And eventually an archaeologist came in and what did he find? He found a site with a lot of burnt mammoth and mastodon bones and a lot of tools. So that's the Kissimwick site. I think it's now called Kissimwick uh, Mastodon Park. And uh, so that archaeology is supported by the Osage's oral tradition of how that archaeological site was formed. And there's a number of um, different scientists that have used oral traditions and actually linked them to environmental events across time, such as floods and volcanoes. So we do know that, that oral traditions are not stories. Some of them are stories, but a lot of them are actually history. And if you look at um, other other forms of indigenous recording, such as rock art, you'll see a lot of uh, pictographs of extinct species. And so mm -hmm. indigenous people were recording uh, their history in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and this is something that crosses my mind because the, the basis of this channel is something that's a bit more critical of technology and, and civilization is I hear this a lot. It's like, well, you know, all human humans they they're invasive they're parasites and they wiped out all the megafauna right you know as soon as and if you operate on the idea that people have been here for roughly ten thousand years yeah there is some type of correlation between that arrival and the die off of the megafauna but it's like well if you start you know following logically that people have been here much longer that sudden die off doesn't make as much sense do you think the 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 die off or over hunting hypothesis is related to this colonial narrative or do you think it's incidental i think it's uh i think it's a dehumanizing story that was created as a colonial narrative so one um archaeologist and a paleontologist did a study of megafauna species and of 28 megafauna species only two of them had signs of being hunted and used for food. And that was only at a very few sites. So a lot of times when uh, academics, Western academics tell you a story, it's very biased and very slanted. So I know there've been, been stories that uh, put the blame for the megafauna uh, species die off on indigenous people. They're not telling you the whole story though. They're not telling you that of 28 megafauna species that went extinct, there's only evidence of two ever being hunted, two types of species and only in a few areas. So I think it's pretty clear yeah. from that data and other data that the, and, and people have begun writing about this now, the die off was likely due to environmental change. Right, right, because it's interesting that if humans you know, and we do see humans add another pressure, right? We are tool makers and storytellers, but it's interesting that all this die off seems to be almost worldwide at a very similar time frame. That it's like you're telling me that that all the humans just get together and decide, oh, we'll just all do this at the same time, or is it because, as we know, we have the, the interglacial period is changing, things like that? It's or is it maybe you know a more global affair? And I just it's one of those things when I hear that all the time, I cringe because it, it seems so outdated, just like the Clovis theory. But of course, academia has made it such a monopoly that has entered into the general, you know, mass consciousness without any critical relationship between those two things. And so it's just something I wanted to bring up. In your book, you talk about, and I, I found it so interesting because it's not something I've ever heard expressed this way, is that land, you know, which include these archaeological sites are are not incidental, they're not locations, right? They're not spots on a map, but they're a collection of stories. It's like a library. And so you talk about that it's a synthesis, your book is like a synthesis in some way of Western archeology, span indigenous scholarship, and it's a handbook for social justice. And so you have this underlying notion, or maybe it's an ethic for your work, pyroestimology. Can you 
epistemology rather, is that something you can quickly define for us and what is its relationship to your analysis? Yeah, I um, coined that phrase in grad school and that was my one bright moment in grad school. I'm like, yay, I, I found a ter term that describes what it is we need to do. Um, so, so Pai wrote, indigenous people used fire to cleanse the land. And so when you have a forest area and maybe um, some invasive species came or some uh, smaller plants grew up and they took over your food area for your acorn trees, what you do is you burn the land and that fire cleans off all of those other species and makes space for the sunlight to get to the earth so that your indigenous species can grow. So epistemology is how we know the truth or how we come to know what we know. So I thought what we need to do is we need to burn that literary field where all those dehumanizing discussions of indigenous people rest. And we need to then make space for new thought and new good discussions to grow in academia. Okay, so it's like a process of, right, it's, it's things have to die so others may be born or regenerate, right? That's what I think is it's a regenerative process. That's what was in my mind as I read this book, is that's kind of like what you were hoping for. Is that a, like a fair way to understand it? Yeah, it's a, a cleansing process using fire. And really, you know, in, in speaking in, in literary terms, it's heart fire. It's what's in your heart and your, your mind and the truths that you find and using that as a fire, you know, and making people aware of things. Like I, I was sent a, a video to review the other day and the archeologist was using the term Eskimo. You don't use that term. It's, it's a derogatory mm -hmm. term. Like we don't use that, it's 2022. And, uh, you know, people really need to get updated on their terminology. And it's like, you know, archaeologists are continually discussing the indigenous people of the Americas as Asians from Asia. Asia mm -hmm. did not exist 12,000 or 20,000 years ago. Neither did a cultural group known as Asians. And so scientifically, what you have is you have indigenous people in the Eastern Hemisphere and indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. But um, mm -hmm. scholars are always applying these contemporary geopolitical terms to uh, deny people their identity as indigenous. So you don't see archaeologists ever discussing the people of the Americas as indigenous people of the Americas. They discuss mm -hmm. them as Native Americans or Asians from Asia, anything but indigenous to the Americas. And that is very, uh, that's violence and it's harmful and it's, not even scientific. So, but but archaeologists who scream for um, you have to have you know solid scientific proof will constantly use these terms to dehumanize indigenous people that aren't based on any science at all. They're conjecture. They're political, and they're dehumanizing. Yeah, I'm going to skip ahead on some of the notes that we had because it seems relevant. So you discuss. An increase in well-being for Indigenous people after a, quote, a revival of Indigenous languages and cultural practices. This well-being was reported as a decline in youth suicide rates and an increase in higher education rates, end quote. That's on page 181. Is this because of a sense of belonging and empowerment or both? And how does, and what is its relationship to this colonial narrative, right? So if people are constantly being denied their history, right? And even if they're not aware of what their true history is, it, it, it's, as you said, it's dehumanizing. As we know, dehumanizing is an act of violence. Cultural genocide is as much a genocide as any other. And obviously the response to that as a youth makes sense that, you know, you have a, a, a I guess if you want to call it, a low self-esteem almost doesn't seem to, and to encompass what I'm trying to say, but what is the process of reclaiming you know, it's not just languages, right, that were also taken away. It's the history. What is the relationship between identity and self-determination and like a group's happiness, if that makes sense? Well, any group that has gone through a genocide and it was both physical and cultural, um, you know, you need to stop and ask what what is the half-life of that trauma? How long does that mm -hmm. trauma last? Well, that depends on um, we know that colonization and racism was rampant and in many areas remains rampant um, in the Americas against indigenous people. And so how do indigenous people who have, um, a lot of them have lost their land, they've uh, had their language 
outlawed, their culture outlawed. They survived a genocide that was meant to destroy their culture. And so we're just getting to a point where it's even safe to discuss that in public. So, so a lot of my students, I ask about residential schools and about the history of the past system and different things, and they have no clue. They haven't been taught that. So you have to look at um, society and education as a whole. Th there's a term called, um, oh my gosh, now I'm thinking of my pyroepistemology, agentology. So agentology is not how we're taught the truth, but how we're intentionally kept ignorant. And there's a book called Agentology that's really good. And that, that's been a very um, strong focal point for colonization and colonial education is agentology, keeping the general public ignorant to the real history of the country, like with residential schools. So the, the government was always stating, well, residential schools since 1860 and, um, you know, 2,000 to 4,000, maybe 6,000 children uh, missing from residential schools. So I had, uh, I hired some students and we did a huge study of residential schools in Canada. And I found, you know, the first residential school opened in 1620. And even though they are not all documented because many burnt down and some didn't have records, I found over 900 residential schools, Indian day schools and Indian hospitals throughout Canada from 1620 till when the last one closed. So if we're going to look for um, unmarked burials and we know we know from um, Dr. Bryce's report that at least 22 to over 80% uh, of the children that were in residential schools died. Uh, the residential schools weren't informing their families are sending those children's bodies home for for burial. So where did they bury them? Where did they dispose of them? If we're going to bring every child home and make every child count, we need to look at every single residential school, Indian hospital and day school site in Canada for unmarked burials. How many do you think would be found if we went by the government's suggestion that residential schools started in the late 1800s, not the 1620s, right? Mm -hmm. and so right. if you look at Dr. Bryce's uh, report and his percentages, and if minimally 150,000 children went to those schools and minimally you took Bryce's smallest percentage of uh, mortality rates, you would see over 20,000 deceased children. If you took his highest, or sorry, you would see over um, 30,000 deceased children. If you took his highest, it would be over... Um, 80,000. And so the, these are the realities that are still uh, largely hidden, and the government certainly isn't discussing it. And a lot of people push back when, you know, communities say they've found, you know, 215 possible burials. Well, well, where do you think that these residential school people put the deceased children? They didn't send them home. And so that's that's agentology. There's an intentionality of keeping people ignorant uh, by the government and by education. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of boarding schools, we just talked about this in the last episode. Is I'm I'm from the state of Illinois, and Illinois has always claimed that we've never had boarding schools for Indigenous youth, and because of the 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 re the revelations, or at least in the you know the at least in the white consciousness um in canada we've had an investigation going on here and it turned out we had two and i grew up in less than like 30 minutes from one and so i visited it and they have these plaques these historic plaques about the school and it says oh it opened up as like a like a boys school and then it failed and then it jumps like 40 years and in the middle of those 40 years it doesn't talk about anything because that's when it was a boarding school and it covered it up the park that owns it denied it and never talked about it until the truth came out and now they they don't open it up to to um, tours or anything anymore because they're scared shitless because they're like, uh oh, you weren't supposed to know that. And then we had another one in Chicago that is still in operation as a boys school. Okay. And so they're similar, you know, and so you talk about, you know, the indigenous paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere and why you are from so-called Canada. Right. That, you know, this is a this is a narrative that affects all indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's like a uniting factor, right? Because the, the the narrative is all kind of the same and it, it might impact certain groups differently. And there might be those those differences is that logically that narrative impacted people quite similarly. And so to see what it happened here in Illinois and how it affects people in Canada, it, it's, it's interesting to me to see that. Um, 
that it's not just one group, right? You know, you're not just speaking for the First Nations of Canada. You're, you are in some way speaking on behalf or assisting the voices of Indigenous people of the entire Western Hemisphere. Um, and so yeah. that kind of links to what I would, oh, go on. Yeah, so there, there's, you know, there's different ways of understanding how this impacts people, but people everywhere in the world, it's important for all people to have their links to their homelands and their time there acknowledged. And, um, you know, the, our links to our homelands have always been cleaved in a violent way by Western archaeologists. My, my daughter went to a, a young woman's gathering in northern BC because, you know, we, there is a lot of high suicide rates, a lot of social and political disparities. And these girls, there was a large group, they were sitting around in a big circle and each one was asked to share one thing that gave them hope for the future. And my daughter said this girl's face just lit up and she got real excited and she said, oh, there's this archaeologist in the States that says we've been here over 50,000 years. She says that gives me hope that we'll get our history, our identity, our lands back. And she said this girl was just so excited that my daughter didn't tell her, tee hee hee, that's my mom. So... <laughs> So, but you know, that, that was a really important message for me because I was looking at the high suicide rates and thinking, I know there's a, there's a lot of flames in that fire of healing. What can I add? Can I add one small flame to that fire that in some way will support healing of our indigenous communities? And this is my way, reclaiming and rewriting our history and make, speaking very honestly and openly about the damage and the violence that has been and is still ongoing in American archaeology. Um, and I mm -hmm. know that Indigenous peoples appreciate that. Some, a lot of archaeologists don't. Some that are more open-minded mm -hmm. do. Um, but I... I can't sidestep that violence. I have to meet it head on and call right. it out and discuss it because that's a part of healing and reconciliation for all indigenous people. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, again, it seems that you have such a, you carry it and express it so well, but you seem to have such a, an immense weight on your shoulders. And I, I have a, a, a deep respect for that. Um, the person I just interviewed, uh, he's a, the, the founder yeah, of the OIA, which is Organization for Indigenous Autonomy. And I think the same thing about him and people he worked with, especially in the university we graduated from, starting a youth organization there when the administration said, oh, well, the last one failed. There's no point. Don't do it. Like a white administration telling them, don't start an indigenous organization for youth because it won't work. It's not going to happen. And so like in spite of, you know, I, I just find that these common threads of being told, don't do it, it's not going to, it's not worth it, or it's, as you talk about career suicide, right, it's constantly being told, don't, because yeah. it comes into conflict with the privilege of a, of a certain group of people. Well, the majority of, well, I just have to say all, 100% of um, universities and colleges pretty much in in North America, in the United States and Canada, except for maybe a couple tribal colleges, they're 95 to to 99 percent settler and you can't do anything without their permission right and so yeah. i pushed for two years here to create a new faculty body so we had the faculty of humanities science and um social science and and sitting in those groups i experienced a great deal of violence from the faculty and so i pushed to create a faculty of cross-cultural studies where Indigenous scholars and their like-minded peers who were decolonizing, indigenizing their curriculum could have their own faculty space to work together. Um, the first time right. it came to Senate, it was denied. The second time we squeaked through with one vote. So just this July 1st, we are now the Faculty of Cross-Cultural Studies. Um, wow. But yeah, but you know, you go to a Senate meeting and everybody votes. And so you have to you have to have the permission of all these settler scholars who don't, many don't want indigenous people here or don't see their value and just vote mm -hmm. down everything. And um, right. yeah, it is, it's, um, it's a very violent place. I'm really happy I can work from my office a lot of the times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and Algoma University is a very small university, but it's still a very uh, Western university. They are working um, to understand how to decolonize and indigenize curriculum. We're building a new building that will be called Makwa. 
which will be hold our archives for the residential school and will be designed by indigenous architects and with a lot of input from Anishinaabe people. Um, wow. So hopefully we'll have a new uh, a space where students will feel very welcome and there'll be a lot of, uh, you know, space and time for elders and for other things that you wouldn't see in, you know, your typical Western university. But, you know, when it comes to agentology and colonization and the history of, you know, the first people in the Americas, there's a lot that students are never taught. So students are usually taught that the oldest human sites in Asia, what we call Asia today, are over 2 million years ago. So we know that 2 million years ago, uh, people walked out of Africa, migrated to Northern Asia, and were living in Northern Asia. And we know there are a lot of archaeological sites in Siberia and Northern Asia that date from 24,000 to, to 200,000 years and, and other parts of Asia to 2 million years. So we're supposed to believe that early humans walked 14,000 kilometers from Africa to Northern Asia and stopped. We know that mammals were coming and going. So there's a lot of mammals we know that arose in the Americas. So paleontology really supports my discussions. So we know animals like horses, camels, and saber-toothed tigers arose in the Americas. For them to get to Asia or any other part of the world, they had to walk across the landmass. There's been a yeah. lot of really great environmental work done, paleo environment. So we know there were many times that the lands of the Eastern and Western hemisphere were connected and there was a land mass between them because we know that the mammals were coming and going across those land masses. So we're supposed right. to believe that early humans got to Northern Asia uh, 2 million years ago. They were living in areas of Siberia at 24,000 years ago and earlier, but they never crossed that 57 mile landmass when the animals were coming and going. We're supposed to mm -hmm. believe that humans waited until there were massive glaciers in the way at uh, 12 or 11,000 years ago, and then they migrated or they took a boat around the ice. That's um, conjecture and it makes no sense whatsoever. Right. So, two things. Uh, about what you just said. So can you explain a little bit more? Like, I'm, To me, it's obvious the issue with calling these people Asian or, and as you, you talked about it a little bit, but what is the, the better way to say it? Because I see some people say, oh, what is now called Asia? What is now called the America, right? So is it better to just say indigenous of the East, Eastern hemisphere, indigenous of the Western, and then, right, obviously, if you need to get specific, you can talk about those cultural groups, right? And of course, in the, in the so-called old world, you know, it's, and I mentioned it, like you have all these dual cultural groups all across the Levant who, of course, have different tool making designs, different clothing, different art. But of course, that never applies to, as you, you know, the West. And of course, every single person to many archaeologists, they were just one Clovis people. Um, what is the way to talk about that uh, inside academia and outside of academia? If, for example, if I'm having a conversation with a friend, when I'm saying, oh, they claim they come from Asia, they're all Asians. Right. Maybe that's not the best way to express that. Could you maybe give some insight to that a little bit more? Yeah, I would say that maybe some of our ancestors came from um, the Eastern Hemisphere, the area we know today that we call Asia. And, you know, a, a big part of this, too, people have used that as a tool to um, try to say that Europeans were the first in the Americas. So we found some tools off the East Coast of um, North America on the continental shelf that are well known from the Eastern Hemisphere from the area we today call Southern France. They're called Salutrian tools. And I actually had an archeologist tell me this year, oh, you can't talk about those sites or those tools. You can't say people were here 20,000 years ago because then um, everyone's gonna say that Europeans settled the Americas. And I'm like, you're telling me you're a scientist and we're talking about a time 20,000 years ago and you're convinced that Europeans existed? Europe didn't exist. 20,000 years ago. So I'm constantly mm -hmm. having to correct these so-called highly educated people about their views <laughs> and their discussions. And it's just, um, it's ludicrous. I have to make t-shirts. Maybe I need to make and sell t-shirts and that's a way to educate people. Europe didn't do this, neither did Europeans 20,000 years ago. And so there's mm -hmm. a lot of ways that it's, it's so embedded in academia to just find ways to dismiss the possibilities of early people in, uh, in the Western hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Can you, you mentioned that right there, the, 
the Solutrean hypothesis. And in your book, you mentioned, is it the, the Kennewick controversy? Is there a relationship between those two things? Because it, re- it instantly reminded me of the Solutrean hypothesis. Is there a relationship there? Or do you think that's incidental? The relationship is that archaeologist and, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't an accident in my mind that they called Kennewick someone who looked Caucasoid. I happened to yeah. be working with Dr. Rose at the time, who was one of 18 experts. I was an undergrad student, and he was my um, uh, he was the, the head of archaeology, and he was my research teacher. And he's an osteologist, so he's one of the people that the State Department called to examine the Kennewick remains. And he came back and he told me, he said, well, first of all, Patters and them didn't have it put together right. They had pieces of the skull in the wrong place. They had pieces missing. And he said, no, it, it looks like someone from the northeastern Great Plains to me. So that was, you know, an expert osteologist opinion that this person did look indigenous to the Americas. When that mm-hmm. group that sued to keep the Kennewick remains um, stated that, that he looked Caucasoid, they were trying intentionally to remove him from the NAGPRA law. So under the NAGPRA law, indigenous communities can reclaim um, human remains from their areas and rebury them. And they were Mm -hmm. successful in doing that. And it was just um, absolutely disgusting to me that they did that uh, Mm -hmm. to the tribes. It was very damaging. So, you know, I wanted to discuss that in my book and I made it very clear I had those pictures drawn from the skull without telling the artists where this person was from um, or how old he was. And those are the pictures they produced. And it definitely looks Native American. And so, yeah, there is a link to the way that some archaeologists use terminology to cleave indigenous links to the land, to the artifacts, to the human remains, to the stories, to the history. Anything they mm-hmm. can do to hint at, oh, it's European or it's Asian, dislinks it from indigenous people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that reminds me, by the way, are you familiar with the the bombing in Philadelphia of the group called Move in 1985? I know I've heard of that. I don't really know the details. So they were, they were a, a black kind of anarcho-primitivist, vegan um neo-indigenous almost is a term you could use then they were bombed by the 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 city police because they kind of had the neighborhood that was almost as like a fort and it turned out that several children died and that their bones were taken and used as in an ivy league anthropology course ident- without any consent of the families they took the bones and were used in courses and that reminded me of the, the dehumanization of, of dead indigenous people that that same example seemed very similar to me yeah, I, um, I remember reading about that. And, you know, I, I worked with um, with the Quapaw tribe as an undergraduate. So they wanted to reclaim under the NAGPRA law, which came in in 1990, uh, 500 sets of their ancestors' remains that were taken from their very well-known homeland. So we know where Quapaw villages were and we know where these remains came from. And the university and museums were denying them to return them. They were using loopholes in NAGPRA. So the Quapa asked me, could you do some kind of genetic work and help us reclaim our ancestors? And I was just an undergrad at the time. I wasn't a geneticist, but I said, sure, because, <laughs> you know, creator brought someone to ask me, so I'm not going to say no. So I got an undergraduate research grant. And I got UC Davis, one of the top uh, genetics labs in the country at the time, to work with me. And we got uh, a modern Quapaw DNA haplotype from Quapaw elders' hair samples that they had given me. As soon as we had that haplotype, we could then use match that, to possibly match that to the ancient human remains um, to support the reclamation of those ancestors. But before we even got to the second part, I think the university and the museum knew how stupid they look for not returning them. (laughs) And uh, two weeks after my first results, the Quapaw buried 500 of their ancestors. And that that just told me right there, you know, I was thinking I would go to med school, but that just told me right there, I guess I need to be an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And I I totally have taken us off track. So I want to return back to your work a little bit. And you talk about you've had you know, a collection or almost a library of all these sites 
and you have something that's titled very similar to your book and i'm curious if you want to elaborate on its role to your book and it's what you hope that it can do for indigenous people uh, in the americas is the indigenous paleolithic database of the americas what is it what's its relationship to your work specifically this new book and what do you hope it can do for others well it's a, it's a database that gives the name um the state the age and the publication, the bibliography reference for the people that published on that site. So it's a huge database of archeological facts that show that indigenous people were in the Western hemisphere long before Clovis. What I really hope that site can do is educate people. And so that's the same sites that are in my book. I'm currently working on a new database. And let me tell you, there are so many sites, I couldn't possibly fit them all on a map. So now I'm looking at sites, only sites older than 11,200 years. So the Clovis tool is argued to have existed from 10,800 to 11,200 years before present. So I'm taking every site over 11,200 years and putting it in a new database. So in my book, I was extremely cautious to only use, you know, well-documented, well-discussed sites. Now I'm finding so many reports on so many sites and most of them are very well documented, but there are so many that I, I can't put the sites say between 10,000 and 11,200 years, that would be thousands and thousands and thousands of sites. So what I am seeing continuing my work is that at the time of what they call Clovis, the land was covered with I don't know if it's millions, but thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There isn't an mm -hmm. area of North America that was not covered. And there's lots of areas in South America where there was sites. So I'm working on a new database that will more than double the size of the last database. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably going to be over uh, 800 sites that predate Clovis. And wow. what really what, what I want to do is to show um, communities and graduate students work in this area here's where to you know plan to do some research we need to continue this work continue documenting these sites um they, they just found that site in new mexico the white sand sites with the human foot yep. that date to over twenty thousand years so what i would be doing you know if i was those archaeologists is asking the questions well where did they live we know they were walking mm -hmm. here um in this wetland but where did they live because guess what they didn't fly here. They didn't fall out of a plane. They had to walk right. across every piece of that land and they had to live on that land. And where early people lived, they left us their stories in the ground. Archaeological sites are the stories of their time on the land that they left for their descendants. Those are our stories. And if we're meant to tell those stories, we'll be showing those sites. You know, it's, yeah. it's up to us to push for this work to continue, because how do you get research funded on a site that's 14,000 years old when archaeologists argue that people were only here 12,000 years or a site, yeah. that's, you know, 22,000 years old? How do you fund that when it's denied? And the entire mm -hmm. denial is so um, absurd because like I say, we see people all over the world migrating for over 2 million years. We see them in the area we know today as Northern Asia from you know, 12,000 to 24,000 to 2 million years. That's only 57 miles across a landmass to North America. So right. why wouldn't people have been here? Yeah, um, and so we keep trying to talk about this landmass. Can you talk about what is the the relationship or the controversies of the Bering Strait and then also how some other possibilities of people arriving here because I know we've also heard things about you know sailing you know the arrival you know you have all these different groups because from my understanding it is not a popular idea that it was one migration through the Bering Strait but at least they've come to acknowledge there have been several through the Bering Strait but and you even say like language development you know if they've only been here ten thousand years and they walked here that does not account for the language diversity that you say is so great so grand oh, so yeah. what are what are what are all these these moving parts here well yeah there there are a lot of moving parts but you know, people need to remember that for Western people, the ocean is a barrier. For indigenous people, it's not a barrier. It never was a barrier. It's one extension 
of their land, of their home. They see the land, they see the water in a much different way. And so there's many ways that uh, people could have came and went between the Eastern and Western hemisphere on both the Eastern and the Western coasts. And, you know, mm -hmm. the his human history and human evolution is not a simple linear story. It's not one thing, one time, one way, you know, Mm -hmm. Evol human evolution didn't work that way there were trees going all over the place and we see that in in the diversity of languages by the way and so i think there's mm -hmm. many ways that people came and went but archaeologists need to understand um, indigenous views of the world indigenous views of the environment indigenous people don't see water as a barrier there was nothing blocking them that was an extension of the land that was one of their relations but if they went on that relation, that relation would take care of them. That relation gave them food. And when we, during the Pleistocene times, when we had glaciers, the ocean levels were as much as 300 feet lower than they are today. The entire yeah. continental shelf was dry land. So the distance between continents was much shorter. And if you, right. you, look, you ask Inuit people today, how long could they walk across the ice? They you know, like we've been doing this for thousands of years. Like there is no distance. We just go. There was a, a <laughs> there was a fox that was uh, radio collared in Scotland a few years back, and it showed up in Ellesmere Island, meaning it walked across the glacier ice from Scotland to Ellesmere Island. Right? Wow! And whatever our four legged relations do, we can pretty much do also. And yep. you know, it's it's a, such a much richer world when you understand the worldview of indigenous people. There is so much more understanding of people, how people lived with and moved across the land. And there were no barriers for indigenous people. And what we call the landmass between the Eastern and Western hemisphere that we know today as Beringia, that was dry land many times across the last 2 million years. There were times it was covered in water. There were times it was covered in ice. There was times it was dry land with trees and tundra and plants and food. Um, and it was just another part of the land. Yeah, and I, um, I find it find it really interesting. I can't remember if this one specifically mentioned in your book or not, but the, the possible relationship between what are considered to be Polynesian and South American peoples, the idea of this continual contact and, and intermixing both culturally and 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 genetically are you familiar with that yeah and, and there's a lot of unanswered questions on um contact between continents so there are some statues in india that date i think one was twelve thousand, one was over two thousand years old um, of women holding plants and one of those plants is corn corn was genetically modified from tessanite grass in the americas corn was invented here for corn to get to india Someone had to bring it. There are pottery vessels in, in China that uh, were made by wrapping them around a corn cob. So the inside of this cup type vessel is, is the kernels of a corn. How did China get corn, you know, prior to a thousand or 2000 years ago? So I think there's a mm. lot of really interesting unanswered questions. There's a lot of great uh, graduate dissertations waiting to be done. And some of that work uh, has been begun by people who were just really, really too inquisitive to stick to the status quo and ask some important questions like that. Yeah, yeah, I find it, it just, it's, uh, you know, I was an anthropology major for a little bit in community college before I was like, I don't really want to be a professor, so I don't know what the hell I would do with this. But when I did it, it that's what got me so interested in, in prehistory. And all these relationships, the idea of these relationships between pre-contact people, because we have, you know, or excuse me, pre quote unquote pre-civilized, because we, we there's still in the Western consciousness, I think this Hobbesian war against all. So society at least makes us tolerant to some degree of one another, as opposed to these, you know, not to say we were some noble savage archetype, but like you have trade, you have relationships that are complicated. That you, these are are complicated people, and of course. Uh, with this idea of 10,000 years, it kind of, as you mentioned, are like these people are less evolved to some degree or in some way. Yeah. And of course, that gets into like the phrenology of like, oh, white people are of the top. And then it's you know, Asian or mongoloid, so to speak, right? You kind of still see these outdated racial ideas. 
Yeah, they were taught for as standards in all the Ivy League universities for decades that, uh, you know, indigenous peoples were the uncivilized savage and Europeans Mm-hmm. were the civilized intelligent people. Um, that wasn't an accident. That was by design. That was, you know, brought forward by some of the same people that created eugenics that the Nazis Right. adopted, right? So eugenics... There was a eugenics office in New York State. This was in, created Yep. by American archaeologists. And after, you know, Mm -hmm. after the Second World War, some archaeologists are like, oh, well, that's distasteful now. Let's do physical anthropology instead. Let's not do genetics and Right. eugenics anymore. And so the anthropology and archaeology has grown across time. But when it comes to indigenous people and our times on these continents, That has been cemented by violent discussions and violent actions against archaeologists who published on these sites. Why would you do that? What is your point? You know, human evolution Right. and migration, our understanding. Heck, 15 years ago, they said that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens couldn't possibly interbreed. And now we know that's absolutely wrong. And that we're Right. not absolutely Right. wrong. And so we understand as, as the more we learn and the more tools we have, the more genetic tools we have, the more excavations we do, the more that human history changes, but not in the Americas. Never changed, never going to change. But hopefully my book will go a long way in starting to, um, oh, and, and I've seen that it has opened those discussions up and that more people are publishing on Clovis sites And it's really important to really get that message out there and to really have those archaeologists that stick to their guns on this understand that this is a violence, not just against indigenous people. It's a violence against archaeologists and humanity, and it needs to stop because it's absurd. Right. Right. So a couple more questions. Returning to Clovis, you mentioned, you know, you had this, what are basically Clovis police, they're gatekeepers. What would you say, unless you think it varies too much, are the most common opposition to the pre-Clovis sites? Is it, oh, because I see this, it's, it's, oh, well, the flooding moved those things around, or there would have been some geologic affair that would have moved the layer you know moved them between layers they just so coincidental how many great things would have been happening for these sites to become invalid so what would you say are some of the most common op oppositional points to that Well, a couple of the archaeologists that have published on pre-Clovis sites, like Tom Dillahay and um, James Adavasio, has said that, you know, people like the Clovis police will make up anything. And, you know, mm-hmm you're a great archaeologist as long as your site and your work is younger than Clovis. The minute it's older, you're a very bad archaeologist and everything is wrong. I think one thing that's really clear nowadays is that this denial of earlier people is simply based on conjecture. It's not based on fact. It's based on conjecture, bias, and racism. I, I got an email Right. this week. One of those Clovis police is 96 years old, and he's still denying it, and he will never, um, you know, accept that people were here earlier. Never change his mind. Jesus. And Wow. the sad thing is they have trained thousands of archaeologists who are in the same place, will never change their mind. And, you know... People have give far too much trust without understanding the colonial history of archaeology, which is why I had that uh, chapter in my book to make it clear to people this colonial history and archaeology, this bias, this racism, it's very well documented. And it's not just discussed by indigenous people. It's discussed by a number of archaeologists who were brave enough to tell the truth. And so it's really Right. important for people to understand, don't just take what you hear at face value, learn about it, challenge it and push back. Because, Yeah. you know, just the point that humanity, what we've learned everywhere in the globe is completely changed, but not in the Americas. Just that point should be big red flags for people. because there's a lot of Yeah. archaeology. And we, we do see a lot more older sites now uh, being published. And, uh, and Mm-hmm. that's wonderful. I think that um, some people are less afraid now to publish, but there is still a very uh, strong embedded fear among archaeologists to publish on a site that's older than Clovis because you know you're going to face severe critique and have to answer it. And really, you know, Yeah. the archaeologists that do Clovis sites, they know what they're going to face. 
They know the critique they're going to face. So they probably spend three to four to five times as much money. They get three to four to five times as many dates. They are extremely careful in their work because they know they're going to face immediately critique whether their work is solid or not. Yeah. Yeah. I just, that's, that's incredible to me. So I'm curious because you don't mention it so much. You mentioned a few examples of people who have kind of faced academic suicide, but I, I'm just curious what what have you faced and in, in relation? You've said you got the email from the 96 year old. I'm curious. Just in addition, does does it intersect with being a, an indigenous woman? Like, is there? Oh, you know, is is the for example, if the if a white male archaeologist publishes something, you know, that is pre Clovis, would the response that in critique against him be different than something you have faced or would face? I think the critique against me has been very mild. I think people are in some ways afraid to critique me because you don't want to mm -hmm. anger the entire indigenous community who supports mm -hmm. your work. But there's a lot of pushback in quiet ways. And so I'm working mm -hmm. cu currently in a school that doesn't have a graduate school and we only we don't have an archaeology program. We have a sociology anthropology program. Uh, I'm very happy in my work. I've made my own way here. I have tenure. I have a Canada research mm -hmm. chair. So in my mind, I'm listening to the creator. This is where he wants me to be. This is a good space for me to work. But I have done, uh, I have applied to um, archaeology jobs in some of the biggest schools in Canada and the U.S. I only got one interview, and that was this year. And during that interview, um, two of the interviewees were extremely, extremely angry. So they invited me down there to interview for three different positions. And I'm pretty sure now knowing they were never going to hire me. And during my interview, they were, one woman was so angry. I thought her head was going to, top of her head was going to blow off. And she said, you need to change the way you talk about archaeologists and you need to say the nice things that we do. And I was just floored. I was absolutely floored. So here I am. I'm a well-known uh, international scholar. I'm the only indigenous, paleo-indigenous anthropologist of the Americas that I know of. I've got a very successful book, a successful career, and an archaeologist invites me to an interview and tells me and asks me, are you going to change the way you talk about archaeologists? And I said, absolutely not. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I, I was just like, floored for a week and then I discussed it with my a few of my friends and they said you should have immediately walked out of that interview but um right. but I didn't I wanted to <laughs> wanted to hear the rest of it so this is you know and then you know I do talk honestly about the history of archaeology and archaeology mm -hmm. does not and anthropology often appreciate that I know that there are some right. that are. I know that there are some professors who are using my book as a textbook, um, and I'm very grateful wow. that they're uh, open-minded. And uh, sales of the book wow. have been really, really good in the first year, like way over what you would normally have for an academic, you know, book. But, um, mm -hmm. but like I, one one of the things I, I was going to mention earlier, and I think I forgot, is that you know we're raised in urban areas, and we lose our cultural ways, and we're actually taught that you're taught that if you listen to voices and you listen to intuition, no, you can't do that. Only crazy people do that. I had to retrain hmm. myself to listen. So I always remember right. the words that that Elder Leonard Sampson told me back in 1988. I was a single parent with a grade eight education three kids, one terminally ill, a truck and 26 cents. And here I am, a Canada research chair and, and an associate professor with tenure, you know, and that there's not that much distance in there. But part of my getting here was learning to listen. So not what do mm -hmm. I want to do? What have I been asked to do? What does the creator want me to do? What is my path? Well, Elder Leonard Sampson told me that in 1988. He didn't say anything about archaeology. He told me I would have a really difficult, important job to do that would really help all Indian people. And I just get goosebumps now when I think about it because um, I had no clue that, that then that I would ever even go to college or get a degree. And so part, part of for me, you know, keep doing this work is listening. And, and I look right. in for what it is I'm supposed to do. And I just continually work you know, seven days a week on, you know, building a new database, doing this research, 
um, creating new faculties and safe spaces on my campus, decolonizing curriculum. Um, and it's really been a wonderful learning field. And I'm still being given lessons, though, about how colonized archaeology and academia really is. So my interview this year where people were so incredibly rude to me and so angry showed me that, um, you know, archaeology does not appreciate someone who tells the truth about the history of the discipline and how it has and continues to impact Indigenous people. But I will never stop because it has not changed and it really needs to change. I'm concerned with the next seven generations. How do we make safe spaces for them? How do we make spaces where maybe they're gonna hear that we don't know how long indigenous people have been here, but it's probably more than 24,000 years. That's a lot less damaging than saying we're Asians from Asia who only got here 12,000 years ago, right? These yeah. discussions in classrooms are violent against indigenous people who come from their communities knowing that they've been here since time immemorial and for every community they have their own understanding of what is time immemorial and it is certainly not the western story of how long we've been right. here right and so i was going to wrap it up but i wanted to touch on one thing because you you mentioned it is the idea of what I, we hear safe space and i talk about it in my own teaching position because i teach in a in a in an urban school with a large with a largely with so-called hispanic and in black population particularly uh we have a lot of guatemalans so like mayan speakers actually so we have to start developing a mayan program for language immersion for mayan speakers and things like that we talk about what a safe space is especially when i have to earn my space as a white teacher in a largely non-white environment is so when people say safe space some people cringe because they get this like you know this like anti social justice warrior notion so what is a safe space for what you call knowledge production and what does that what does that mean is it a place to facilitate discussion or is it a place to protect from trauma or are those one in the same one in the same i'll give you a brief example so in graduate school i you know my first couple of years i had to teach a a, part, a class with a faculty and so I had to read the textbook he was using. So first year archeology span students, and this is how that book described an artifact. An artifact can be a beautiful 20,000 year old spear point from France, or it can be an in indistinguishable flake some weary Indian chucked out in a Mississippi cornfield a thousand years ago. <laughs> uh, that really hurts, right? Yeah. I'm an indigenous student reading that. And how, what does that, give non-indigenous right. to embody right right it really, it's it was and when i brought it up to the professor he went through the roof and you know he's since changed his view but um but yeah i i came into grad school when they were still using texts with those kinds of dehumanizing discussions but not based on science because that archaeologist that wrote that book wasn't there a thousand years ago and doesn't know if the indian was weary or energetic it was all conjecture, but it's how you talk. So I think part of making mm -hmm. safe spaces, one of the most important things is read the textbooks that you're giving students to read front to back and use pyroepistemology to burn off all those ones that are dehumanizing. There's so many good, uh, good books now. There's so many more indigenous people and informed settler academics that are writing good books. Uh, you know, and writing good lesson plans and creating um, good films that we can choose from. So I think a part of it is just that we have double the work our predecessors had because we're having to cleanse all of the the literature and the teaching materials and replace them with ones that are more um, have a, have a broader worldview. And you know, ninety five percent of the world's knowledge is kept from students. So if you look around and right. start adding that 95% of the world's knowledge, what a rich environment you're going to have. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so this kind of relates to one of the last questions I wanted to ask is you say, quote, well, what does this mean for accomplices, allies, particularly white, end quote. And I think in some way you answer it because you say, quote, to stay silent is to allow violence and colonization to continue. It is essential to rewrite indigenous histories in that continue to erase diversity and humanity, end quote. And so I personally want, I, I tend to think that like the mayor minimum is to be loud, be supportive, don't perpetuate the myths. But like you said, it's listening, the importance of listening and not, and 
you know, because I the way I express it, and I'm not trying to ask, oh, what do white people do? I, I don't want to rely on on that, but it's what I find is that white people in even in left leftist or activist spaces love to talk, right? They love to talk without realizing that there's a social context that elevates their voices above other types of voices, right? If those are black voices, indigenous voices, migrant voices, etc., that I think we need to spend a lot more time listening, which is what I was thinking a lot when I was reading this text and being in conversation with some uh, of my indigenous friends. And so what are your thoughts about that in the role of people who, who are white or not, want to support your work and the work of others? What, what, do, what do, especially not in academia, but in the mainstream, what do they, what can they do to support your work and the work of others? Um, they can be vocal. They can find me or other indigenous scholars on Facebook, on Twitter. They can find our publications. Uh, they can teach their children to question what they're taught because a lot of mm -hmm. students are still going to go into archaeology programs and be taught the Clovis first hypothesis. And those students need to know how to speak up in, in a way that they feel safe and how to question that. So I, I think one of the things that pissed my professors off more than anything is that I didn't have this awareness of there are things you don't ask. I didn't have this awareness of, oh, we stay inside the status quo. I just asked, I was like the bull in the china shop. I just asked a lot of questions. And if I heard something that didn't make sense or I knew something different, I added my voice. And I had grad students stand up in class and shake their fist at me and tell me to shut up. Um, it was wow. it was not often, you know, a welcome environment. I had to fight my way through like you wouldn't believe. I had four graduate mm -hmm. committees because people were trying to intentionally make sure I didn't get through. But uh, but Creator had my back, and here I am. Wow. And so, what can people in academia, if there's, I have a few academic friends who who I know do listen to this, even if they're if not in archaeology and anthropology, what can they do? Is that you know, you know, realizing that their work, it's not just about themselves, obviously, it's about others, what can they do from their position to support well, a, a growing the narrative? Yeah, I think they need to really be aware of the status quo discussions within their own departments, and they need to push that narrative. You know, and so if somebody is teaching a class on anthropology and archaeology, that let the faculty uh, become informed, let them read indigenous and black scholars, let them become informed and let them start voicing that information in their departments, let them push for change uh, within yeah. their own departments. But, you know, to do that, you have to understand what it is that you're pushing back against. So you have to fully right. understand colonization and how it works and you have to understand where it is that you want to push it to go so that means reading and studying indigenous and black and minority scholars and voices mm -hmm. so of course in in the description of this of the video here we'll have the link to your work is there a best way what is the best way you prefer that people purchase your text um it's available online it's in some bookstores because they've requested it being an academic book, it's wow. not in Barnes and Nobles, you know, or, you know, the big bookstores, but it's in all the online bookstores and also from the University of Nebraska Press. And it's available in audio, ebook, hardcover, and I think now you can pre order soft cover, which is less expensive. Gotcha. Yeah. I want to say about your text, by the way. Well, I was nervous because I don't read a whole lot of academic stuff because I just graduated college. I was like, all right, I'm, I'm fucking done for a little bit with that. But then I, I saw this recommended to me and I was like, all right, it is, I think one of, if not the most accessible anthropology texts I've ever read. Um, in the sense that, you know, I've read anthropology stuff that are not necessarily done by academics. I've read stuff, you know, like 1491 and 1493 by Charles Mann, who is a journalist who talks about the history of the Western hemisphere and its impacts on the world. But I think your work, it's, I cannot think at a time, unless, you know, I'm going to, uh, with the exceptions of talking about specific sites or specific pieces of evidence, for the most part, it is one of the, if not, like I said, the most accessible pieces of academic work I've ever read. So when people, when you say academic, I don't want people to be afraid to read it because they're like, oh, I may not understand it. Of course, you have to do supplemental research on certain things, but I thought it was extremely w well written and it's, I, I thought it was a beautiful text and I was really, I was really impressed with it and I was happy that I had the chance to not just read it, but then to to have conversation with you, even if it took a while because COVID decided to, to hit me like a train. <laughs> yeah, and I, um, I told so, my publisher, um, 
you know, he asked about my writing style. I said, I'm indigenous. I'm telling a story and I'm writing a story for everybody. I'm not writing for academics. This is a story for indigenous people. This is stories they can mm -hmm. share to counter the Western story. And he said, I, I don't think that can be done, uh, but I did it. And I hear that from a lot of people yes. that it's totally accessible. They see the data, they see the science, but they hear the story. And so I'm really happy to right. hear that, you know, people find it accessible. Yeah. And so the last thing I'll ask is what are some other publications that are going on or authors or researchers that you would recommend people look into past or present that are also doing similar work? If, if there's any you could recommend. Um, there's very few that pull it together the way that I did. So most archaeologists mm -hmm. write on a specific site or a small area. Uh, I'm the only archaeologist I know that covers two continents and synthesizes all the archaeological data and, and tries to synthesize oral traditions from some of those areas. Uh, there are a few other archaeologists that have written books that have, they discuss anywhere from 20 to 40 archaeological sites. Uh, Tom mm -hmm. Dillahay and James Adavasio, uh, Dixon and Dixon had a really good book with 40 sites. I, there is one website online where I recommend five books but um, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called right now. <laughs> well, if you remember, I can make sure to put it in the description. And like I said, we'll have the Indigenous Paleolithic Database of the Americas. And then do you have a name or, or a way that people could access the upcoming database or will it be on the same website as It'll be the on the one? same uh, website, which is tipdba.ca. Okay, awesome. And then the book, of course, is the Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. Dr. Steves, I appreciate you coming on. This was a great conversation. Is there anything that you wanted to to say before you left? Is there anything about your work or anything else? No, just um, very happy to see that people are reading the book and just want to tell people, never be afraid to challenge the status quo and speak up. Um, silence doesn't make changes, but being vocal does. So I just want to thank people for all their support. Uh, for, for getting my book and becoming informed. And Miigwech, thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you. You have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.